I want to welcome everybody in here to, tonight to our chapter 43 of Isaiah, and we'll begin with a, with a blessing. Baruch Atad and I, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshana B'Mitzvotah, V'tzivana L'Asok B'Divrei Torah. Bless you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in words of Torah. <clears throat> okay, so tonight um, we will be looking at chapter 43 and uh, right in here where it's talking about the deliverance of, of God's people and um, the time frame. Again, he's, he's right about the time where uh, uh, Sennacherib is, you know, that uh, Sennacherib is, is around uh, Judah. And <clears throat> so it's just around that time. We don't know exactly because a lot of it he's talking about in the future. And um, so, and I had... Uh, put this circle around here because somebody had asked me and said okay now when they had a hard time with, with reading the um the timeline here and what that uh what that meant so i just circled that so it kind of tells you where where isaiah was you know where he actually started um <clears throat> his ministry in the in the waning years of uh, king uzziah's um uh, King Uzziah's um, reign, and uh, we had to, we had to run all of Pat's dogs out of here, um, and then he um, he he went ahead and he reigned. He was still in ministry as far down as uh, now. This this timeline here kind of shows um, that uh, you know what he ended up somewhere around. 691 but uh uh <clears throat> i think that it should be extended another 10 years or so because he was he was uh, martyred or he was killed anyway by uh, uh manasseh and so after hezekiah had died so uh <clears throat> i think we could run uh, isaiah from yeah, somewhere around 782 or seven uh, seven forty two somewhere around there to uh, seven uh, to six eighty one, and so that was anyway that was a question that somebody had come up to me offline last week, and how that okay so yeah and that that would have run him over into uh, into here someplace uh, under the rule of Manasseh, all right. All right, uh, verse one. But now, thus says Adonai, the one who created you, O Jacob, the one who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So um, the Lord called his people uh, to not fear, even though, you know, he says that they were they were blind, deaf, and suffering for their sins. He uh, he had created this nation of of Israel with a lot of care. You know, he had redeemed them from Egypt, and um, he had um, um, you know, and, and and during the Exodus, and then they had a, a special um, special. Uh, time at mount sinai and um um his acts his his actions for israel uh they were they were for israel and not against uh israel and uh, so anyway it was god's re relationship with them that uh, that would guarantee their their um their future as it were. So um, then, and there's also this, uh, this dual reference. Um, there were two, two names, you know, it said, uh, um, talked about, uh, Oh, Jacob, and then, uh, Oh, Israel. And so, um, 
I've heard, I've had people talk about, uh, you know, say, well, when God says, oh, Jacob and Israel, then that means he's talking about the, uh, the group of the northern, 10 northern tribes and the, the two southern tribes, and, and he's talking to them differently and so forth. And um, I reject that. It's normally the ones that uh, the people that are saying that are the ones that uh, are into the uh, uh, the ten lost tribes, and that uh, nobody knows where they are, who they are, but except that uh, they'll they'll say that you know that the, the tribes are lost, but then they'll go ahead and tell you that <clears throat> oh yeah, well the tribes were uh, they they moved to, uh, to the British Isles. And there are the tribes, you know, the people of, of uh, Great Britain and Ireland and Scotland. Uh, that's where the t the ten tribes ended up, and the and the uh, uh, the uh, tribe of Dan. That's what Denmark and and so forth. Which you know, that's that's silliness. But um, anyway, they uh, this idea of the Jacob and Israel is used like thirteen times in in these ten chapters. And um, with just one exception, it's always Jacob and then Israel. And then uh, there's one ver in, uh, in um, um, chapter 41 and verse 8, it's reversed. It says Israel and then Jacob. And so, uh, you know, Jacob was the deceiver of, and he had become an Israel, a prince of God, okay? He went from being the deceiver to then being a prince with God. So the uh, the order of the names may hint, I don't know, this is maybe a stretch, but uh, it could be a hint that the Jacob character of the nation of Israel, of, you know, the nation of God's chosen people there, uh, the, that, that Jacob character uh, had to be abandoned. And so then uh, it it would be implied that maybe um, uh, that Israel, the prince with God, is the is the um, true destiny of the people, and so uh, they they're supposed to they will become Israel, the prince with God, and uh, as such, the heirs of the promises that had once been made to their ancestor Jacob who became Israel. So um, I don't know that, uh, you know, it, it's it's a thought anyway, that uh, uh, why they would say Jacob and then Israel and Jacob and Israel, you know, those 13 times with, the, with one exception is that the people would have to make that shift from being the nah, not so not so good people to the ones who are actually the, the princes of, of God. And so um, I don't know if anybody has any any comments on that one, but uh, calling the people where he says um, that uh, I have called you <clears throat> by name, you are mine. And that would also bring in this, this idea of the closeness that uh, God felt with the people. Rich, you got something. Yes, I was just going to say, Rabbi, that uh, Jacob could rec could uh, I'm sorry, Jacob could uh, resemble the carnal nature of man apart from God, and Israel could reflect uh, that spiritual nature that is in tune with God and His righteous nature. That's, that's a good call. Yeah, I mean that's uh, um, that could very well be uh, part of that. Um, that you know that they certainly at this point in time where we're talking about with with Isaiah, but in 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 truth, all the way from the time of uh, the conquest or even before coming out of coming out of uh, Egypt, uh, it didn't take them very long coming out of Egypt to reflect that carnal nature with the golden calf. And then the uh, rejection of, of uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb and the, the acceptance of the other 10 spies, that sort of thing. And then, of course, you, all you have to do is recite all of the cycles of, of um, idolatry and then redemption, and then back to idolatry that went through the, uh, the book of Judges. So 
uh, at this point that Isaiah is talking to them, um, it's, uh, it, you know, they're still representing that carnal nature that, uh, that um, uh, would have been Jacob before he became Israel. Um, uh, Randall, can, I, can, can I mention a point? I, I'm just thinking that, just thinking how, you know, God may call you by name and end up changing your name, giving you a new name, but he may end up having you go through a lot of trials and end up wrestling with them and you may end up walking with a limp for the rest of your life <laughs> yeah very well uh well in fact one of the uh, one of the comments that uh that i read one of the <clears throat> quite a few things that i read for these classes they had talked about that uh again it was kind of a stretch you know you look at the the hebrew and it's not uh it's not really there but he was trying to make this deal that for god has called you by uh he called you by name you are mine and he was saying well what it really should mean is that i have called you by my name you are mine but that's uh you know when you look at the hebrew i'm i'm not i'm not seeing that um and so, but he's called you by name, meaning that you're close enough that he's not saying, hey, you, he, he's calling them by a specific uh, name that, uh, um, that means, you know, if, if, especially if it's gone back to Israel, it's, you know, you are a prince with God. So um, anyway, kind of, kind of a, a bit to, to unpack in that first, in that, just that very first word. Our first uh, verse. Um, so going ahead, uh, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you or through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, nor will the flame burn you. All right. So, um, we find that you know water and fire are actually uh, traditional symbols for testing. That um, you know it's and when they're when they're put together like that, the water and the fire that kind of uh, implies then a total testing of just that an all-out testing. God promised to protect His people from um, total destruction. When they underwent their various trials. Now, uh, he had done this in the past. He would do it again in the future uh, because uh, we would be, uh, he would be with his special people at all times. And so this is a consequence, a special consequence of belonging to God is that he will preserve his people through whatever trial it is that. Uh, um, that he, um, wh whatever trial that they may face. And um, um, yeah, Rich brought up a good point. He says, notice that it says, when you pass through the waters, uh, I will be with you. Not if you pass through the waters. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we're going to go through some stuff. Uh, even, you know, any, any and every one of us, I think God is going to put some things sometimes in there to uh, it's, it's not particularly to maybe to test, but to um, uh, strengthen, maybe to discipline, maybe to uh, uh, exercise us, maybe uh, all those different things that, uh, um, you know, it's, it's the exercising that makes you stronger. It's the trials. It's the tests that you go through that then ends up, up making you a, a stronger person, a stronger believer. And so, yeah, I think uh, um, we, we all go through that and even, even maybe some temptations. But uh, the Bible says that, you know, he's not going to put any temptation on us that, uh, that we're not able to bear, you know, that it just kind of, you know, um, whatever whatever that temptation may be uh, against uh, or you know that comes up against a person uh it's not something that uh, you just inescapable that you cannot uh, uh 
just not be able to uh, um, to avoid it. Uh, so, but it's always when you when you pass that temptation, when you when you uh, overcome that temptation, and and then don't succumb to it, uh, it just makes you a stronger person. Uh, and you know whatever whatever that temptation may be, and and it could be something as as uh, um, you know, it's just, you know, uh, something I do all the time, kind of letting my alligator mouth overload my hummingbird rear end and saying stuff that maybe I shouldn't. Um, and so sometimes you know, just have to uh, have to be quiet about it. OK, and, and I hope all of you have pulled up the chat so that you can read the uh, um, the the chat portions there where uh, um, Warren had. Uh, had uh, put on there that uh, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them all, delivers them from them all. And then Rich uh, said to circumcise that body of death so that the life of Yeshua may grow and enlarge and become the dominant life within you. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what we're looking for to get to the point where when people see us, they're actually looking and seeing uh, Yeshua shining through us, and that's that's the, really the goal. I think that's what God um, um, his his purpose for us is is to um, uh, just shine the light over the whole world, and and people can see us, uh, see Him through us. Okay, so um, verse three. For I am Adonai, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Um, though, so these three names, <clears throat> the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel and Savior, that, that just kind of reinforces this unique relationship to Israel. Now, offline, uh, uh, somebody that was uh, that's living in, in uh, Saudi Arabia right now had uh, uh, texted me and said, had you noticed that how that Isaiah uses the, the Holy One of Israel as a name for God? He uses that over and over again, uh, much more than, uh, than anyone else in the Bible. In fact, it's not really found that often anywhere else in the Bible other than in Isaiah. Why do you think that he uses that Holy One of Israel? And really the only, uh, my thoughts on that was that he uses that word as a comparison, because look at all these these times where um, Isaiah is talking to the people about how big God is and how worthless and little and tiny and insignificant those little <laughs> idols that they have may very well be. And so he's making that, that distinction about the Holy One of Israel, the Holy meaning set apart, not only, I mean, yeah, set apart as well as flawless and all powerful, all uh, knowing and, uh, and every omniscient, omnipresent and uh, omniscient, omnipresent or whatever, you know, the, he's everything. And whereas these little little gods are nothing. Okay, Rich. And because back in chapter six, Isaiah had a very personal encounter with the true and living God, and he saw the holiness of God. Oh yeah, when uh, in the in the year that Uzziah died, King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. That one. Yes. That yes. One? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean that's uh, uh, how many sermons have been uh, have been preached on that. That uh, uh, in the year the King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. You know, did he not see the Lord before that? Maybe not. Not so much because why? They had an outstanding king who needed God when they had an outstanding king that was doing everything right. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was an eye opener for, for Isaiah, but, uh, uh, now, um, I wanted to bring that part out. Now this, this idea of the, the ransom, <laughs> uh, 
I, I read, I don't know how many commentaries on this, and, and it's it's just all over the globe on that, what that ransom thing means. It's not very well understood what that is, other than, uh, you know, because everybody had an idea on specifics, but I think uh, I would I would say that uh, uh, it just goes, to, he's telling them that uh, the bottom line is that no price was too high for God to pay, uh, you know, to no, no price too high for him to pay to protect and preserve his uh, chosen people. And, you know, God is kind of in that business of uh, no matter what the price for his people, for the world, for his created ones. Um, and so we look at uh, what about he gave his only begotten son so that the world, the world might be uh, saved. He said he loved the world so much uh, that he gave his only begotten son. So uh, this was, uh, you know, this concept here uh, just, it flows right on down into the, uh, into the New Testament also. So, Rabbi, isn't it, yes, isn't, it, isn't it interesting that, uh, I mean, so often the Lord would use foreign nations to bring correction to Israel, you know, and, but in the end, you know, he, he said, woe to those nations. So, I mean, because what he, you know, because he ends up, you know, those empires end up going. I mean, the ancient Egyptian empire, that's gone. I mean, you, uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking immediately back to the, uh, uh, the, the horse and the rider cut, cast into the sea with the crossing the Red Sea. The Egyptians went there. Uh, Christian Seba, that's down in uh, Ethiopia and south south of Egypt. Those all aligned with 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 the Egyptians. That's the same thing, but all throughout history, be it the Babylonians, be it the Assyrians, the Hittites, or, or whatever, um, and the Lord would would use uh, Gentile nations to bring sure. correction, you know, as as the judgment. I mean the I mean, the 70 years uh, Babylonian captivity, for one. Right. But um, the Lord brought judgment against those, those nations in the end. Mm -hmm. He did, but, it, but look at those, those nations. Those nations were not godly nations. They, they had really nothing uh, within them to recommend them for anything other than judgment. So he was he was uh, he was using them, of course, um, and God can use anything. I mean, he uh, he used a donkey one time to talk to a false prophet. So, uh, you know, well, in terms of the ransom that I, I will give people for for you in your stead that yeah. you know, they, they will be the ones who pay the price. Right. They, and that's what I'm saying. It's not going to be you. It's going to be these these nations that come against you. Yeah, and uh, that's what the, the different commentators, uh, uh, you know, some of them did say, well, yeah, it was he would trade is uh, Egypt and Cush and Ethiopia for uh, Israel uh, becoming a nation. Then others says, oh no, it's because he would uh, he would trade Assyria and that their their uh, um, empire would would die out so that Israel could be a nation. And then somebody said, "Oh no, it's uh, it's Babylon." And so you know everybody had a had a, uh, a particular nation or empire or enemy that uh, they thought that was in view here. And uh, so me, I, I'm just a simple man, so I don't know. All I say is that. Uh, uh, that whatever it took, God was going to take care of his people. And we, we see that uh, borne out in, uh, later on in the, uh, the uh, birth and in the, the death and resurrection of Yeshua, his only begotten son. So I think this is just, a, again, a foreshadowing of that concept. All right. Um, Verse four, since you are precious in my eyes, honored because I love you, I will give a man in exchange for you and other peoples for your life. And so I think this is just uh, um, uh, 
just another way of stating that that God would go whatever the distance, he would do whatever was necessary to save his people. And why is that? Because he truly loved his people and he had that relationship with them. And, um, you know, it all started with Abraham, went on through uh, with Isaac, and then finally with the, the deceiver Jacob, who was a pretty good wrestler. And, um, um, so through all of those those uh, instances, uh, God never never really turned his back on the people, you know, 100%. He always kept a remnant, and he said he would always have a remnant. In the, in the future, when um, the nations come against Israel during the Great Tribulation, and much of Israel is going to be, uh, you know, much of the, uh, the um, population of Israel will be destroyed, but he says, I will keep a remnant. And from that remnant, you know, that uh, will go into the millennial period uh, with a an Israel that is going to be strong. And then, of course, that, that will be the seat of government for the entire world. So God will never turn his back on, uh, on Israel. <clears throat> and uh, uh, they, they will never be replaced um, again, I'll put my little pitch in here for uh, the uh, against the the concept of replacement theology that uh, that we see sometimes where people say, well, because uh, Israel rejected uh, uh, Yeshua as the Messiah, then God has replaced Israel with the church. And no, he hasn't. Uh, he hasn't. And that's you know we could we could talk about that one for a long, long time. But uh, God will never turn his back on uh, on his people. Going ahead, um, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Um and uh, okay, Martha says, God is the kinsman redeemer for Israel like Boaz was for Ruth. Yep, I mean, he's that's uh, that's a great story. And uh, the the whole idea of that kinsman re, uh, redeemer, and that's what uh, what God did. He he redeemed all of us. He's he saved all of us. So um, now this this deal here again, uh, the Israelites, should not fear. The reason is, again, that God was with them. And we see that in verse 1, 2, and 3. Uh, worldwide scattering, you know, the any, whatever, however many diasporas that there are, that there are um, would not prevent him from fulfilling all of his promises to his people and giving them a future in the promised land. Um, you know, he would... Uh, said he would reassemble the the sons and the daughters from the ends of the earth. Now, um, I think it, it speaks much more than uh, just the Babylonian captivity because, um, you know, the Babylonian captivity would be just from the east, okay? They would come back from the east into, into Israel, whereas now he's talking about from the entire globe, wherever they may be. That would, uh, uh, so that would fit with maybe... Um, um, that would fit with just a, 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 a totality of all the, the diasporas that have been out there, you know, the, the, uh, Assyrian, the Babylonian, the, the, uh, uh, Greek, the, uh, Roman, uh, and so forth. And, you know, the whole era from the Roman period up until, uh, today. And so he's called an, in some measure now, he's called the people back to Israel, but then it's going to be in earnest and really uh, people will be amazed at the the um, the Jewish people that will be coming from all the world during this uh, millennial period when Yeshua comes back uh, to a uh, rule and reign from from uh, um, from Jerusalem. Okay, um, verse seven and eight. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, I, I formed him. Yes, I made him. 
bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes who are deaf yet have ears all right now we finally get to this point where he's talking about those who are called by my name and uh You'll see that in this ver in in this particular verse, it just wasn't in that very first one. So, uh, what qualifies these people for such treatment? Uh, you know, with uh, you know, it's it's their relationship to Adonai. They are called by His name now, and are therefore part of His family. And so, it would be like uh, a parent calling a child by their first name. Well. Um, it could be Bill, George, you know, Sally, Mary, whatever. And there could be lots of Bill, George, Sally's and Mary's. But then when they say Bill Smith, Sally Smith, George Smith, you know, that gets it a little bit more uh, specific because now you're saying, okay, you Smith kids, come on, let's go. Um, and so the God is saying, okay, all you Jewish kids, uh, come on, let's go. You are, you are, you know, my name, all of Adonai's people, you are mine. And so I think that's, um, um, that's where it says being called by his name that, that then, uh, includes us into his, his family. And so, um, um, you know, God brought these people of the Jewish people into existence to glorify him. And so uh, their condition then reflects on God. And so unless he restores them, then they can't really fulfill his purpose for them in the world. They have to be, they, they would have to have more of an elevated status to really get to the point where God wanted them to be. So, um, but anyway, uh, God is, uh, you know, Isaiah continued to show that that God was both willing and able to de deliver his people. And that was, we saw that back in um, chapter 42. And so he confronted the, the little G gods again, but this time he challenged them to uh, bring forth their witnesses, you know, and, and, uh, um, and to, to uh, name their deity. And so now he's also calling his own people. Um, this time the captive Judeans were Adonai's witnesses and, uh, they would in, uh, you know, despite their spiritual blindness and deafness, they would give witness to, to his ability to predict their salvation and then to actually accomplish it. So, um, God, uh, would actually make his own people and their witness the evidence of his deity. And, uh, you know, he's using his own people then to show the world that, okay, yeah, I am the one true God. And so Isaiah, um, you know, he, he used this, this uh, courtroom um, genre here. He summoned up a, some unidentified authority, whoever it was, it, it's, it's not, uh, it's not critical, but to, to bring out the Israelites, the spiritually blind and the deaf. And uh, so we see that this is a courtroom setting. And so the, uh, Isaiah is summoning them so that God could address them as his witnesses. So um, you can imagine, or maybe you can't imagine, I don't know, calling someone who is blind and deaf as a witness in a court of law, what could they see and what could they say? Uh, and yet uh, the Lord would even use them to testify to his greatness. I just thought that was kind of a, an interesting thing because he had called them bl uh, blind and deaf, but now you're going to be my witnesses. So um, again, Isaiah's use of, of the language was just is, is incredible. All right. So all the nations are gathered together and the peoples are assembled. Who among them can declare this and proclaim to us former things? Let them present their witnesses so they may be justified or let them hear and say, it's true. You are my witnesses. It is a declaration of Adonai. 
and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed and there will, there will none and there will none after me. Okay, so no God was formed and there will be none after me. So um, Isaiah pictured all the nations in this, in this courtroom setting and uh, some have already been assembled. Others are on their way. And so he says, who among them, uh, Isaiah asked, could proclaim former things? The former things probably uh, refer to things that, uh, that were predicted in the past and, and had come to pass. Uh, and so no one among these nations, none of their little G-gods could predict the future and then bring it into existence. Only God could do this. And so uh, no one could serve as a witness that uh, that the idols could do this. I, I mean, none of the, the idolaters could then bring up their idols and say, oh, yes, here, I have Ishtar, I have Ashtaroth, and I have uh, uh, whatever, Dagon, and all of these ones. And Remember when he said this, well, no, they, they never say anything and they couldn't predict anything. And certainly they couldn't make anything come to pass. So God is saying, okay, where's the witness for all you little G gods? Um, so um, undoubtedly some of the uh, pagan false prophets uh, claim to be able to foretell the future and uh, you know, and that uh, their 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 predictions had come to pass. You know, just like today, I guess we've got uh, we got some psychics that uh, make such claims. In fact, we have some people on uh, on uh, some of the religious channels now. You know, the the uh, I'm not going to name any of them, but uh, you know, they would uh, they would make these predictions. Uh, one of them said that, uh, you know, I can remember years ago uh, when uh, uh, Barack Obama was running for president, this one uh, prophet uh, said, oh, yeah, the Lord had shown him where that uh, that uh, Obama was going to going to give his heart to the Lord and that he was going to be a strong influence for the nation and that uh, uh, that so all of the Christians should go out there and vote for this man because he was God's man for the hour. And um, um, we know how that turned out. So uh, why anybody would listen to that particular guy after that, I have no clue. But uh, he was he was popular. And, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, looked at that and said, oh, yeah, well, he said it. So I'm going to go vote for Barack Obama. Um, so you know, but then, you know, other, other things, even Nostradamus uh, came up with some predictions that seemed seemingly came true. So, you know, even the, you, you know, even a blind squirrel can find a nut once in a while. Uh, so I'm sure these pagans could do that too, but their the, the um, accuracy of their, their predictions, and then the ability to make the predictions come true. All they're doing is guessing but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can make the prediction says, now watch this, you know, I control the table. It's going to, it's going to uh, come to pass just like that. So, um, uh, so the Lord pointed to the people of Israel, his servant, as uh, those who would be his witnesses that he could predict the future and bring it to pass. Uh, he had promised to make Abraham a great, great nation to deliver the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, to give them Canaan, and to make David's dynasty secure. And he had fulfilled all these promises, plus a whole lot more. And um, in the process, he had made the Israelites his witnesses so that they would learn that he alone is the one true God. So, um, you know, Isaiah had... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, Yeshua then told his disciples that they would be his witnesses. And that was in Acts um, first chapter uh, one and eight, I think, uh, where he says, you're going to be in my witnesses in all the world in Jerusalem, uh, uh, Judea, and Samaria, 
and the entire world. And so they had seen his works for a couple of three years, and they could testify to the the just the uniqueness of Yeshua's work and even to his deity, because why? They had seen the resurrected Yeshua. And so uh, that's why, you know, an early confession of that Nazarene, that community of Messiah in first century was, yes, Yeshua is Lord. And so that's, that's why they, uh, that's why they could say that because they had seen it. They were witnesses. I am Adonai, and there is no savior beside me. I alone declared, saved and proclaimed, and not some foreign God among you. So you are my witnesses. It is a declaration of Adonai, and I am God. From eternity, I am he. None can deliver from my hand. I act, and who can reserve, reverse it? So Adonai alone, among all the little g gods, is the only real deliverer, the one that uh, uh, he knows the future. He's the ultimate sovereign, and uh, he's unique. And and uh, none of those idols was Adonai. The Israelites could certainly bear witness to that, but you know they were blind and deaf, and so uh, God was then testifying on their behalf. He says, "Yes, you know it," um, and so. In the first part of uh, the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah had demonstrated that God alone can be trusted, that all other resources, all the other nations would fail. And so now he's showing that uh, when we have refused to trust and have, you know, because of that refusal to trust, we've reaped the, uh, the consequences of that, uh, that again, who's going to save us? It's only God can save us. So it was only, you know, he's he's been there forever. He's been there from the very beginning. He was there before the beginning. And since uh, he's the only deliverer, no other God can deliver any of his people or overrule his decisions. And so it was foolish then for the, for the Israelites, as it is for all of God's people, to, to look to anyone or anything else for salvation. Um, you know, and... Um, uh, someone, uh, someone had said, uh, you know, one of those little, I don't know, memes or something that says, in our world, it's cool to search for God, but uncool to actually find him. And uh, that's kind of a, that's, that's kind of a sad, sad uh, thing to say that, uh, yeah, you know, people are, they're searchers, you know, in fact, there's even, even uh, churches that say, yeah, it's a seeker friendly church. And, um, so I, I, and I, I've heard that term. I'm not really sure what it really means, but, uh, uh, you know, my, my prayer is that people seek the Lord and then they actually find him and follow, follow him and follow through with it. So, uh, in the future, God would use Israel to demonstrate to the world in a fresh way that he was the only savior as he had done in the past. He would make his people the evidence of his sovereignty, his deity, by delivering them from captivity in Babylon and delivering them from their sins. And so um, uh, his, his salvation of his people would be actually in spite of their lack of righteousness. It was nothing that they could do. In fact, they were the antithesis of that. But that uh, uh, he would save them no matter what. And it was uh, it was actually in spite of them and not because of them. Going ahead. Um, hmm. Thus says Adonai, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake, I will send to Babylon and bring down the uh, fleeing Chaldeans or Chaldeans, uh, all of them in the ships in which they exalt. I am Adonai, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. So um, Adonai, Israel's redeemer and the holy one, he was going to bring judgment on Babylon for the sake of the Israelites. Now, he, his judgment would be for the sake, you know, in two, two senses here. Um, it would demonstrate 
his sovereignty to, uh, to them in a fresh way, and it would also fulfill his covenant promises to preserve them. The Babylonians would flee as fugitives from the Lord and his instrument of punishment. You know, who was who was chasing them now? Well, the Medo-Persians and uh, Cyrus and that bunch. Uh, Isaiah pictured them as fleeing in boats, sailing south down the Euphrates River. And so um, possibly, um, uh, you know, you can note the similarity between the Babylonians and their ships on their river and the Egyptians who also sailed ships on their river, the Nile. The, the uh, Chaldeans also called the Assyrians were the warriors of southern Mesopotamia who actually formed the uh, Babylonian Empire. Okay. Um, and so here I'm reading these uh, these chat things because we do have people on the phone that, uh, um, that can't read the chat. Uh, Warren says, those who trust in vain, in the vain pronouncements of modern false prophets are much like naive women who unwisely marries an unsaved man with the mistaken belief that she will lead him to the Lord. Yeah, that's always dicey when you uh, see something like that. Um, okay, and Rich Withers, uh, okay, he had it here. He uh, says, seeker-friendly brings the world into the church in an attempt to be a credible witness to the lost. the um, um, They entertain the goats and barely feed the sheep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's a good, uh, I guess that's a good definition. I've, I've always, you know, I've heard this, the, uh, this term about, well, that's a seeker friendly church um, and really didn't, uh, didn't understand exactly what, uh, uh, what that, uh, entailed. Um, so, um, so in, in verse, uh, and let's see, look at, and up here in uh, verse 15. So uh, again, uh, God, uh, it, this is a reminder, it kind of brackets what he was saying, uh, that the promise of deliverance uh, uh, where God was, uh, he would, uh, he would not deliver his people because of who they were, but because of whose they were. He was out and I, who would uh, he'd reveal himself uh, himself to them at uh, Sinai? He made a, co a covenant with them. He was their holy one who had uh, shown them um, how to share in His holiness. You know, He tells us to be holy like I'm holy, uh, meaning that be set apart. And uh, He was creator of uh, of Israel, and He brought them into existence from nothing. You know, re remember when Israel. Uh, they went into Egypt as 70 souls, and then they came out as millions, And but they were still a collection of tribes, of 12 tribes that in some cases didn't even get along with each other, um, but they were all the descendants of, of Jacob, and so he brought them then at the Mount Sinai and formed them into the nation of Israel when they accepted his covenant. And so that was the beginning of the nation of Israel, almost instantaneously, within just a matter of a few days. So I, I, I took, uh, I, you know, here's a picture of um, these boats that they were talking about that would be sailing up and down the, uh, the Euphrates River. And uh, again, that's a kind of an artist's, um, representation of it and I, I saw other boats but they were they seemed to be a little bit more um um these these were more primitive and i think probably uh more uh, uh likely what the the boats would have looked like at that point all right uh, verse 16 thus says adonai who makes a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters who drew out chariots and horses the army and the warrior they will lie down together and not rise again. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. All right. So Isaiah had given a, an, uh, an unusually long description of the, the giver of that promise. You know, that he was 
uh, you talked about uh, before the the uh, Adonai, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the Savior. He had, he had given that description so that um, uh, because of this long pro the promise that was to follow, because uh, only that kind of that kind of God could make all of these things come true. Um, the the one that was giving the predict uh, the predictions was the one who, in power, love, and faithfulness, had delivered his people from uh, from Egypt at, during the Exodus, and uh, his destruction of the is uh, of the Egyptian army and that that uh, whole empire had been complete. Uh, the uh, the Pharaoh that was in charge at that time. Uh, was normally, you know, every spring he would go out on another military adventure. Well, he didn't go out on another military adventure for years after that, because why? He had no military. So um says, do not remember former things, nor consider things of the past. Here I am doing a new thing. Now it is springing up. Do you not know about it? I will surely make a way in the desert, rivers in the wasteland. Okay, so obviously God did not want his people to, for, uh, to forget what he had done in the past. He's always calling us to remember. You know, Rosh Hashanah is a time, so it's a day of blowing the trumpets and remember, remember, remember what? Remember all the things that God has done for us. So, but what he's talking about here is that, um, you know, he didn't, um he wanted them to not look to the to you know to look back he wanted them to yeah remember what god had done for them but now he's wanting them to shift their focus forward what he's going to do for them he was going to do a new thing for israel something that would appear unexpectedly like a a sprout from barren soil of uh, and <laughs> If like here in Texas, where uh, it's it hasn't rained now in two months, and uh, uh, yeah, a sprout coming up out there in uh, in the grass where it's not uh, not uh, uh, rained, yeah, that would be very very unusual. And so um, the Israelites would would become aware of God's plans for them even though they had no knowledge of it at that time, okay? And uh, he would uh, he, he was going to bring the, the captives back from Babylon, and uh, uh, he was going to redeem them. He was going to free them, just like he had done in, in Egypt. He was going to make a, a way for them. He was going to provide them with water. And so uh, instead of turning a sea into dry land like he did in in uh, in the Exodus, he was going to turn the dry land into waterways. Now, so uh, these images that he's he's saying here are kind of a um, uh, a second Exodus. Okay, only the some of the roles are reversed there. Um, and so uh, let's go ahead and twenty the field animals honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the desert, rivers in the wilderness, and give drink to my chosen people the people I formed for myself so they might declare my praise. Yet you have not called on me, Jacob, for you have been weary of me, Israel. Again, we see that uh, that duality, the Jacob and then Israel. Uh, so even the animals would acknowledge God's greatness when they when they observe his acts and, and they actually benefited from, uh, from his goodness to his people you know when god blesses his people with water well guess what the animals are blessed with that too and so um we're seeing here the the acts of god that are bringing the whole world into harmony and i think that's what we may start to look at in the uh you know at the beginning of the um the the millennial period uh, so that um, uh, we'll we'll see a transformation. I do I do believe that uh, you know all this business about the world is coming to an end in just five years. Well, they've been saying that all of my life. 
Um, but um, I, I think that once the, the millennial period begins, you're going to see just how that the earth is going to be healed in lots of ways. And so we need not worry about uh, a um, Mad Max type of apocalypse that uh, is going to destroy everything. Uh, God is going to restore. So, um, but he's telling them, okay, you're going to see all of these things. But for right now, you're not really paying attention. You're not watching. Um, and um, even though he had formed them, uh, brought them together, made them a nation. And so um, there's still, there's going to be another exodus a third exodus. I've heard people call him, uh, calling it the greater exodus. Um, when Yeshua comes back to the earth and he's going to gather all of the people, all of the, uh, the uh, Jewish people back to Israel uh, for the millennial reign. So, um, and eventually, of course, Israel is going to say that. They're going to say, Baruch Ababa Shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So uh, the, the Israelites would genuinely worship God uh, because why he was going to, he's going to deliver them from the most horrible circumstances in this final days and the final uh, weeks and so forth of the great tribulation where their, their back is up against the wall and there is no help from any other. And so it's going to be God who saves them. Um, so it says, you have not brought me sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I did not compel you to serve offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have not spent money buying me aromatic cane, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. Rather, you burdened me with your sins, wearied me with your iniquity. So um, the people had they'd brought few offerings and sacrifices to the Lord, even though his, 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 um, his uh, requirements were not all that onerous. And, they, you know, and so uh even the the things that he had told them to bring you know they hadn't even done that and so uh this what they talk about sweet cane he says uh you you aromatic cane uh, you you have not spent money buying me aromatic cane that is uh, uh a substance called calamus and that uh, they use that as a, it's one of the ingredients of the um of anointing oil and so uh Instead of bringing these offerings and sacrifices, he said, all you've done is bring me in an, an abundance of sin and iniquity. And he says, you think you're tired of the worship. I'm more tired of it than you because I know that you're being insincere with your worship. So um, he says, I'm the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Remind me. When we argue our case together, state your case so you may be proved right. So the Lord himself would forgive his people for his own sake, not because they had earned any forgiveness uh, with their worship. Forgiveness of sin is uh, uh, it's a divine uh, prerogative, I guess you'd say. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that only God can do. And so uh, he pictured forgiveness as erasing something that was previously written on a record. We see that in, in, um, uh, in, uh, Isaiah, uh, I mean, uh, in the revelation where God is saying, okay, your name is written in the book of life, but if you don't repent, he's talking to the seven churches. He says, but if you don't repent, I will blot your name out of the, of the uh, book of life. So that's just right. The opposite. And here, uh, their transgressions were written down. And now he's saying, I'm going to erase those and make sure that uh, uh, I'm not going to remember these sins ever again against you. And uh, again, it's like, you know, the East is from the West. Uh, they're, they're never going to come back and, and uh, those sins will never come back uh, to meet you. So um, God is omniscient. Certainly he never forgets anything. 
but he is uh, he's promised to uh, uh, that he would forget those things. Uh, and I know it's kind of a, a paradox and it's uh, so forth. Uh, um, I think the word is an anthropomorphism or something like that. Okay. Um, don't try to use that one in, uh, in Scrabble. You just, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, he was not going to hold their sins against, uh, against them. And he would not call their sins to mind. He was forgetting them. So when God forgets, uh, for, uh, forgives something, he forgets it. And, uh, uh, he treats the sinner as, uh, if he had forgotten his sins. And so, um, that's, you know, one of those things that um, that um, we see uh, with God that uh, you know in in Jewish uh, in J Jewish mind Jewish thought, there's the idea of the simsum and and uh, that that uh, that concept is that God is so big and all powerful and all everywhere to be able to create our universe where we are, which is vast. You know, our universe is vast. God had to uh, reduce himself by you know a little bitty bit, reduced himself enough so that he could create this vast universe. And so in in saying that, that uh, you know that that still shows how much bigger God is than anything that we can even imagine. And so that's a again, that's that's kind of a, a Jewish midrash, but uh, I think it's a good one. Um, so, Said your first father sinned, and your medit uh, and your mediators rebelled against me. And so I profaned the sanctuary uh, officials and gave Jacob over to destruction and Israel to scorn. So what he's saying here is that uh, Israel's sin was traceable all the way back to their ancestor Jacob, or maybe even further back. Um, the, you know, other possibilities could be all the way back to Adam or maybe Abraham, uh, whatever. Um, the uh, the leaders of Israel, as we saw, consistently sinned against the Lord. And so not just this present generation that Isaiah was talking about, uh, but, um, you know, going all the way back through their their history so, so God would profane or he would disrespect the priests with uh, with guilt. And, you know, they had, uh, in some cases, uh, the, the Bible talks about how the, the, the priests were not teaching the, ch uh, the, the children of Israel, the people of Israel anymore. They weren't treat, uh, teaching them the ways of the Lord. And they were just, uh, it was just a uh, uh, system of rote, uh, you know, liturgy and sacrifices that and uh, they just did what they they uh were doing and not teaching the people the holiness of god and being separated to holiness and separated to uh good things so uh so god said okay i'm just going to put you all into uh um a ban uh i think the the hebrew word for the, that uh, the ban there is uh uh harem and uh so it's something that was devoted to destruction of uh, jericho was put under a ban and other other cities would be put under a ban so um israel had become sort of like canaan and they were going to be punished and uh, but at the same time um he was going to bring them back and it was you know they were going to be kind of a for a while, they were going to uh, people were going to look at uh, at uh, Israel with disdain, but uh, eventually God's going to bring them back, and certainly in the millennial period, uh, He's going to make them the ruler of the world. Okay, now Martha had said, "We are so glad when God forgives us our sins and doesn't hold them against us. If only we would have a change of heart to not sin anymore, to please God and to worship Him." Okay. Yep. That's uh, that's a fact. Just don't slip back into that old uh, into the old habits. So anyway, that's that's the class.